הפסנתרן הגדול מרי פראיה עומד להציג לפנינו היום את הסונטה הגדולה של בטהובן, הלא היא הסונטה המר קלביר. שלום מרי. שלום אריק. I have a question. Symphony number one by Beethoven is about half an hour. Symphony number two, about half an hour. All of the sudden, Eroica, how long is it? It's long. <laughs> It's longer. <laughs> Thirty-five. Twice. Yeah. Twice as no, long. No, 40. M- maybe 40. Maybe I don't more. know, maybe 50, yeah. Was it carried away or was it premeditated? I think it was a conscious decision, musical decision and a personal decision. When he was younger and he was composing these many sonatas, uh, Opus 2, uh, uh, Opus 10, and the early symphonies, it was like a young man, almost a young man in a hurry, very influenced by Haydn, but going in his own direction, everything original, everything with energy and with enthusiasm and bubbling over. And then came the heroic period, where he wanted to portray what it means to be a hero. And he dedicated the um, Third Symphony to Napoleon, which he later crossed out. But it didn't matter. For him, the ideal of a great man was something that propelled the, the sonatas, like the Appassionata, the Wallstein. All that middle period was towards depiction of the hero. I loved it. Young men in a hurry in the beginning, <laughs> And now, when he writes the hammer clavier, he's really mature. Yes. And he's not anymore in a hurry, or maybe no, a little bit in the first movement is still... The tempos are fast, and uh, we don't know, except from descriptions, how Beethoven played. But they said, for instance, when he premiered the fourth concerto, that it was very fast. And the yes. fourth is a lyrical piece. I have a feeling, because I've listened to some of the list pupils, people like Dalbert, Frédéric Lamont, and they all play fast tempos, and it all sounds like Czerny without, the, <laughs> without uh, Beethoven's heart. Without the, and um, they have Beethoven's heart, that is, uh, Dalbert was a great pianist. Uh, but what it is, is that there's a lot of energy in it, and uh, that's what propelled Beethoven to do such fast tempos. Or, I yeah, guess. but altogether, the Hammerklavier is certainly the longest sonata by Beethoven. Oh, by far. And one of the longest compositions, and maybe it has the longest single movement, the That's adagio. Right. The ad- Some was... pianists play it how long? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I played very short. I played 15 minutes. Yeah, but Schnabel did... Uh... Twice the tempo. Yeah, the 25 or something. Yeah, and like played this. it beautifully. But, uh, yeah, you know, um, deciding tempos is a very complicated issue with a pianist because, you know, the, the composer will give you a metronome marking. In this case, he, he does. He gives us... And this is a, evidently the only one sonata he the gave a metronome. The only one sonata. The only one sonata he gave a metronome marking. That's Do right. you have any idea why it happened to him? No, I think he fell in love with the met- metronome at some point, yeah, this, with the Eighth Symphony, <laughs> this, that, that thing. <laughs> this uh, invention by his good friend Meltzer. Meltzer. Uh, uh, in the uh, beginning, they were good friends, and then... <laughs> Parted company. Yeah. But he liked the idea of trying to give a specific indication. And I think composers always mark their tempos too fast. I just, you know... But a performer can't go to the piece and say, oh, that's the uh, composer's metronome marking, we have to obey it. Hmm. Because there's so many internal factors. There's harmony, there's direction, there's structure. There's so, and your own personal feelings towards it that have to come into play before that you can do just uh, a metronome marking. You have to live it. If you're going to make music that you feel from the heart, it has to emanate from the heart, not from a machine. But talking about the machine, you certainly remember the tempo of the machine that Beethoven himself gave here. That's it. 138 to the half note. (laughs) 138. Let's put it... Can we? It's impossible. Well, I, I think it comes out hysterical. Sorry. It's like for a movie, a silent movie or something like yes. that. How can you bring out the feelings? 
that normally you have to it for structural reasons. I don't go into them. But you can't ignore all of the feelings of the piece just to be with the metronome. So I don't uh, take it. Uh, I, I take it that it has to be fast. It can't be as it's used to play. <laughs> Maestoso. It's not a Maestoso movement. It's a comet, a comet coming from out of space. You know, the story with this sonata is that he couldn't write for a year. He never wrote a piece. He was so depressed. His health was bad. His alienation was complete because of his hearing. He couldn't hear what anybody said. He had a big battle about his nephew. It was driving him crazy. He felt so isolated that, for me, it's the heartache in this piece, in the slow movement, that's really the center of the work. And around it was his heroic effort to get something from his imagination. And it landed like a comet. And that's why the fast tempo. And let us hear now just the beginning of the first movement. Thank you, Murray. That was really marvelous. Uh, normally, after an allegro movement of such a tempo, the composer will write a slow movement, but not here in the Hammerklavier. No. What he does is he writes a scherzo movement, which somehow deconstructs the material of the first movement in a somewhat funny way, but more ironic uh, way. In other words, you have... puts that gesture in one little phrase, and he sort of uh, makes fun is too strong a word, but has fun with it. And the two consecutive first movements are nothing but to prepare the adagio, and we shall talk later about the adagio, and just let's hear a little bit of the scherzo. Thank you so much, Mari. And now we are really ready for the adagio. The adagio. What can we say? 
Well, it's one of the deepest, most saddest. Uh, it's very long. I think it has a connection with the Ninth Symphony, slow movement, um, in the f form of it and in the shape. Um, you see there's these long violin passages which ornament this tune. And uh, the same here, this tune at the beginning. How much sadder this is. Pianist played so slow. Even Schnabel, Schnabel played it for 25 minutes, almost twice as slow as your tempo. Can you play it for us in Schnabel's tempo? He plays it, he plays it very beautifully, but I feel that it can't be held together, this long, long phrase. It goes on, I don't know how many bars. It, it can't be of a piece if it's done on this profound, slow tempo. Beethoven also writes a metronome marking for this, and it's fast, it's the, about the tempo I play. Uh, and you know, I can't help thinking that it's inspired by the only piece that Mozart wrote in F sharp minor, the only piece, mm -hmm. and that's this. Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, it's the same tempo, Adagio. Yes. <laughs> the same lilt. Exactly, exactly. That's what I wanted to get in this, the feeling of a lilt. So that somehow it's a very, very sad, almost Barcarolle, perhaps that's the wrong feeling. He writes a very strange thing. He writes appassionato. In, in the case of Mozart, it's Siciliano. Siciliano, so yes. Even here, yeah. he writes appassionato. He writes appassionato, and I think that's more in the sound. The sound has to be full of suffering. has that a passionate lost. And then this chord, um, which determines the whole piece, this grief of this piece. And so, so it's very difficult to do that with the unicorda, which he also suggests. That means the third pedal, everything is very soft. It's a very difficult mood, very difficult piece to play. I'm holding the edition of Arthur Schnabel. We mentioned his name as a slow performer of this. No, I have the greatest reverence for Arthur Schnabel. I mean, he's one of the greatest pianists that ever lived. And Schnabel did the two things. He edited the sonatas and he, and he played, played them. them. Yeah. And Mari Peraya <laughs> does the two things. You play them and you are editing them. I noticed that you have not yet edited the Hammer Club. Yet. No, uh, because that's a lot of work to edit it. First of all, there are pages, you won't believe it, pages and pages of untranscribed sketches. Untranscribed, because nobody can read his handwriting. So we have to get a group of students to go over to the Beethoven house and decipher these hieroglyphics that he wrote. And then one of the sketchbooks got missing in the Second World War. But Nottebaum, who corrected it, not corrected it, who uh, told about it, uh, wrote about it, um, he gives us many interesting things of 
of what was in that book. So we have to collate those things. It's important to know the sketches. For instance, um, I hope this doesn't get too esoteric, but in the first movement, there's big argument. It becomes um, like a political issue, whether you play A natural or A sharp. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And there are three sketches with A natural. That's a lot of evidence that it's A natural. So we use all of these things, uh, sketches, first, first edition, there's two first editions in this case, one for England and one for uh, Germany. But as for the adagio, it's not only the issue of the text, but it's the emotions. Yes. There are some Chopin-esque oh, yes. parts in this movement, like a prophecy for the Romantic era. Absolutely. It's like a nocturnal. On a separate basis, we would say... So it's Chopin. That's Chopin. That's right. That's, that's Chopin. Right. But you can feel his heart in this passage, the grief that's in there. It's just very, very touching and moving. I'm still in wet eyes. I read somewhere that homophony harmonies are subjective. 
And polyphony counterpoint, counterpoint is objective. Do you agree? I don't quite know what it means. <laughs> <laughs> that if you write harmonies like in the Adagio, then you talk about mein Herz, mein Schmerz. Yes. And if you write a fugue like the last movement is more abstract. There's an there's a element of truth in that. This is a very difficult movement to understand. And he's rough. The harmonies <laughs> become rough. And I think it was Toby, I'm, I'm not sure who it was, that compared it to an Old Testament prophet yep. that doesn't talk politely, <laughs> doesn't uh, end his words mm. with correct whatever. Uh, this one is full of rough edges, and you feel the passion with which he's speaking. At the same time, there is a lot of logic. Um, all of the contrapuntal issues that he does, they're emotional as well. Um, for instance, the beginning is quite positive. Question, answer. And the answer answers the, the very first statement. So there is a logic to it. It makes sense. When he turns the whole thing upside down, The theme is backwards, uh, you hear, and then, um, sorry, that's backwards. And I'm not sure the listener hears it, but it becomes an oasis in the piece, quiet, thoughtful, the, and this he gives to the listener to contemplate how he sees the theme, which is from a different angle, totally. And then, in some point of the fugue, in D major, That's right. we hear the Ninth Symphony. We hear a hymn to peace, a hymn to uh, heaven for peace. That's right.
question, my last question for today. <laughs> Actually, I have more, <laughs> but last for this show. Um, my friends told me that they heard you playing it uh, in Bucharest currently, recently, and then another friend heard it in Beijing. Is it a good piece for the public? It was considered as a bad music for the public. You know, Busoni said something about the public that I always carry in my head. He said, the public, if you would speak to them as they're coming in, you'd speak to them about their life or something, you'd be not impressed, sometimes impressed, a little bit impressed. No, nah, nothing really. Okay, there's no genius there. When the public makes its statement with the applause, they know exactly how much, how, they know as a genius what the performance means. Now, with the Hammerklavier, it's a very difficult piece. So it's not, you know, like a list thing that the audience goes crazy. They have to take it in. And they realize that it's a little bit beyond the vocabulary. It's almost modern music in a way. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's not because it's very tonally based, but it's wild. It has the craziest harmonies and uh, so they're digesting it. And that shows you that they're a genius because they take it for what it is and they try to make sense out of it. And I am sure that it is also Mari Peraya. Uh, who made it. Because this piece was considered as love at second sight, never love no, at first no. sight. No. But you made them love it at first no, sight. Uh, Thank you so much, Mari. Very touching. Thank you, Ari.